Welcome back to the China History Podcast. Part two this time in the life of Morris Tugun Cohn. Last time in part one, after a hard scrabble life in Poland, London, and Canada, Morris is ready for action, and he's going to experience no small amount of that beginning in this episode. As soon as he alighted in Shanghai, Cohn made his way right to the Astor House Hotel in the International Settlement and began doing what he'd pretty much do for the next four decades. He worked the lobby. This was his element. This was the arena where he knew he could shine and amount to something. The Astor House, by the way, was the first international-style modern hotel ever built in China. This structure went up in 1846, and it was already a grand 76-year-old establishment when Morris Cohn started hanging around the lobby. Back then, and still today, bars and lounges and hotel lobbies are a common place to meet customers and business partners. Morris Cohn was not shy, let's just say that. He'd park himself somewhere in the bar, start a tab, and he'd chat up whoever he thought might be interesting in some way. He was always trying to get in on any deal he could and would name drop mercilessly to show he was somebody. Morris Cohn never lost his Cockney accent, and he had that look of a rogue about him. Some were turned off by his style, but many were not. And from his days, hanging out with his Chinese mates back in Canada, he knew enough about what was happening in China to sound halfway intelligent. But from meeting Cohen, most any gentleman of quality knew right away that he was low-born, and whatever education he possessed, he learned it on the streets of somewhere. Morris Cohn didn't waste any time. Through a Russian-Jewish emigre named George Sokolsky, he worked at Sun Yat-sen's paper, the Shanghai Gazette, and he got to meet the great man and the woman he would serve till the end of his days, Song Ching Ling, known also as Madame Sun Yat-sen. With railroad contract in hand, Cohn went to meet Sun and was just bowled over. He knew right away that he'd have no trouble dedicating his life to Sun and his cause. They discussed the details of the contract, and after finding all in order, Cohn let his people know it was a go, and they dispatched a couple reps to Shanghai to ink the deal. Just like the Lufthansa heist did for Henry Hill and Goodfellas, this railroad deal made Morris Cohn. He got to bask in quite a bit of shine, and he tried to parlay this deal and his closeness to Sun as a way to puff himself up in front of other KMT people he came in contact with. How he did it, we'll never know. But for whatever reason, the Guofu himself, the father of modern China, gave the okay to allow Morris Cohn into his inner circle. And from that point on, end of December 1922, Morris Cohn carried a business card that read, Morris A. Cohn, ADC to Sun Yat-sen. ADC meaning aide-de-camp. Cohn served as a bodyguard to Sun Yat-sen, but mostly you could describe him as a gopher at large. And of course, anything that required mixing with the Brits, Yanks, or other Westerners, Sun would often send Cohn to do the dirty work. February 15, 1923, Sun took a trip to Hong Kong. By now, Sun was like a rock star and had the support of a wide swath of people, mostly in the South. He was treated like rock and roll royalty, and wherever Sun Yat-sen went, there was his Fu Guan, Morris A. Cohn. A Fu Guan was a bodyguard, or aide-de-camp. He did all the things you'd expect of a bodyguard. He cased joints, scanned crowds, and kept anyone suspicious as far away from his boss as possible. Cohen and his fellow bodyguards protected not only Sun Yat-sen, but Song Ching Ling as well. He was already quite a character, but now... Morris Cohn really went all out to reinvent himself. His uniform was always the same. A light-colored suit and tie and a sun helmet. He looked like a tough guy not to be messed with. He was already handy with a gun and taught his fellow bodyguards how to properly use one and how to fight. The number of bodyguards slowly rose from a handful to more than 200. By March 23, 1923, Sun had been made head of the military government based in the South. Sun's goal was to unite China and do away with these warlords, mostly in the north and central part of China, but 
also in the South. If you're interested, I did a whole ten-part series on the history of the warlords from 1916 to 1928, and I invite you to go check that out. People called on Sun Yat-sen all day and night, and Cohen was constantly kept busy being in the middle of this. Not only Chinese called on Sun, Westerners as well. They too sought him out. Just in case he ended up on top, people knew they had to hedge their bets and keep a dialogue open with Sun's Kuomintang government. Travel writer Harry A. Frank wrote of these days, quote, Rarely during our months in Canton was the Generalissimo seen in semi-public without Mrs. Sun II at his side and the belligerent, or at least highly protective, face of Mr. Cohn in the immediate background. When we had the honor one Sunday morning to call upon Dr. Sun at his cement factory headquarters and residence, his Canadian shadow, tucked into a corner of the stairway at the entrance to Dr. Sun's study, scrutinized not only me, but my wife as if to make sure that we did not come to wreak mischief on his chief. End quote. 1920s and 1930s were rough times in China. A lot of things were happening, and still, since 1911... Everything was still trying to get sorted out about who was going to be in charge now that the Qing dynasty was gone. Sun's rival government in the south was a constant target of these warlords. So being a bodyguard for Sun Yat-sen was pretty serious work, and there were plenty of people who wanted to rub the revolutionary leader out. Sun was well protected, but so were many political leaders that ended up getting assassinated. Moisha didn't have to wait too long, and during one of these attempts to kill Sun Yat-sen, he and his fellow bodyguards exchanged gunfire with the would-be assassins. Morris ended up getting shot in his left arm. It was only a flesh wound, and he survived it okay. But like the time he stood up for Ma Sam back in Canada, this particular attempt became another seminal moment in Moisha's life. Morris Cohn said later on about this incident, quote, The bullet that caught me in the left arm had made me think. Supposing it had been my right arm, and I carried my gun that side, I'd not have been able to use it. As soon as we got back to Canton, I got me a second gun, another Smith & Wesson revolver, and I packed it handy by my left hand. I practiced drawing and soon found that I was pretty well ambidextrous. One gun came out as quick as the other. End quote. And with that, the legend was born and he became known around town as Two-Gun Cohen, the guy who packed a forty-five in one shoulder holster and another forty-five on his hip. His salary was a few hundred Chinese dollars as Sun Yat-sen's aide-de-camp, and you can bet that as soon as his pockets were full, he blew everything on good food, good drink, and entertainment, and whatever was left over was gambled away. This was not just some job. Morris Tugun Khan truly was dedicated to Sun Yat-sen, and he worshipped the man, and by extension Song Ching Ling as well. He admired how Sun wasn't the kind of leader who locked himself up in his compound and tried to govern from behind closed doors. Sun Yat-sen really was a man of the people, and always did these walkabouts where he'd mingle with the masses and demonstrate a genuine concern for their problems. There were times when people would approach Sun Yat-sen and mention some petty problem of theirs, and Sun knew it might sound petty, but the impact on the person was profound. And Sun would tell one of his aides to go take care of it, usually by offering the person whatever pitiful amount of money it took to resolve their problem. He'd use money from his own pocket. And Sun, he was the real deal, and Morris Cohn took his job seriously when it came to protecting him. 1923 and into 1924, things were not looking promising for Sun's government. Aside from the fact that they were broke and had no tax revenue coming in, they couldn't get the support or recognition of the Western powers. The only ones showing interest in Sun were the Soviets. The common turn sent Michael Borodin to the south of China. He began having a dialogue with Sun about Soviet support for his vision of China. With things looking as bad as they were, and with so little international support, Sun, in early 1924, was no doubt happy to have at least one major power talking to him. This is the time when Jiang Kai-shek enters the scene. With Borodin's help, the Wampoa Military Academy was created in May 1924, and Jiang was put in charge. His number two at the academy, of course, was Zhou Enlai. 
As Sun's fame and reputation continued to grow around the world, Morris Cohn did his best to fuel the myth of the amazing two-gun Cohn. He did nothing to stop crazy rumors that exaggerated his role and importance. He knew when to talk and when to act coy and deny certain rumors. And people who didn't know any better would further spread these stories. And Morris Cohn knew he was onto a good thing and that this whole business of being one of Sun Yat-sen's gang was going to lead to a very lucrative career. It didn't take long before word reached Edmonton and everyone learned that their hometown hero was playing a major role in Republican-era Chinese politics. One rumor was more outlandish than the next, and these rumors even made it to the streets of Edmonton that Cohen was an important general and was put in charge of all troops under Sun's control. Moisha really began to go overboard as far as his sense of self-importance and with all his boasting and over-the-top exaggerations about his rank inside Sun's camp. He never knew when to shut up. Finally, he had gone too far, and his words and actions were starting to reflect badly on Sun Yat-sen. Someone finally had to go to Sun and whispered in his ear that a Morris Cohn and his antics were making them look bad. And so in October 1924... Sun Yat-sen gave Morris the good old pink slip, and he was dismissed. But if there was one gift Morris Cohn had, it was an ability to talk his way out of a predicament. He had been doing it his whole life with policemen, judges, gambling collectors, accusers, and now with Sun Yat-sen. He managed to talk his way back into Sun's good graces and swore on a stack of Bibles that from now on he was going to keep his mouth shut. So he was back serving Sun, and on November 12, 1924, he accompanied Sun and his entourage up north to negotiate with the warlords about the unification of the country. But Morris Cohn never made it to the north. When he got as far as Shanghai, he was sent on a mission to Canada to assist in the procurement of weapons and ammunition. Sun went on to Beijing, arriving on the last day of the year in 1924. The father of modern China had only three more months to live. Morris Cohn arrived in Vancouver and proceeded to embellish the myth and preened in front of the hometown crowd about his time spent so far in China. He went ahead and self-styled himself as a general. By the time he pulled into Edmonton, he was quite a celebrity. Someone wrote of Cohn's visit, quote, Back in Edmonton for a short visit to old friends here after more than two years in the storm centers of China, where he was a prominent figure in the government of the Republic, Morris Abraham Cohn, now bearing the title of general and aide-de-camp to President Sun Yat-sen, arrived in the city this morning. General Cohn shows little physical change since he left the city in the fall of 1922, the right-hand man of the President of the South China Republic when seen by the journal was reticent in discussing conditions in the Far East, pointing out that it would be improper for him in his official position to discuss the political affairs of China. You could say this, however, he told the journal, that conditions when I left were very favorable for a unification of the different political forces of the country. A conference was being arranged, and the feeling was very hopeful that it would result in success. At present, I am not in a position to give any further information on the situation." He will remain in Canada about two months, but the diplomatic object of his visit remains a secret. The only word that comes from the lips of the envoy of the Chinese Republic is that he is here to visit old friends and to enjoy a rest after the labors of the past two years. End quote. Morris Cohn's meal ticket, unfortunately, wasn't long for this world, and tragically for China, perhaps. Sun Yat-sen died at just about the worst possible time. March 12th, 1925. Sun Yat-sen only lived for 58 years. As you can imagine, this was also quite a tragedy for Morris Cohn. He returned to China at once to assess the situation. Cohen later wrote, quote, It was the middle of March when I heard of his death. I took the next ship for China, and on that passage, I played no poker. I spent no time in a bar, and in fact, I scarcely spoke to a soul on board. I slept badly, too, and that's something that has never happened to me before or since. 
when I met Madam Sun, I just burst into tears. The bottom had dropped out of my world, and I still felt lost. We left Dr. Sun in the western hills, and for a while I felt that I'd left the best part of myself there, too. I just mooned about and thought how empty my life was now and how little I realized my luck when he was still alive. End quote. Morris Abraham Cohn had to figure out some way to stay relevant within the KMT organization. One thing he had going for him was that anyone who knew Cohn was very well aware of his dedication and loyalty to Sun Yat-sen and the cause for which he fought for. There was never any doubt about the allegiance he showed not only for Sun and Madam Sun, but for the KMT as well. A foreigner like Cohn had his uses, and despite what many in Sun's organization felt about him and his antics, they still kept him close and continued to utilize him as an intermediary with various Western people. And Morris Cohn knew that as long as he was able to remain in this game and be a player, there were plenty more 5% commissions to be earned. The Canadians, British, and Americans weren't as easy to fool as the Chinese. They were extremely wary of Cohn, and knew all about his well-deserved reputation as a braggart and exaggerator of his prominence in the KMT. One person said of Cohn he was, quote, an uneducated, pushy Jew with a low-class accent from a poor family, end quote. And in many ways, Morris Cohn had become a caricature of himself. So Morris Cohn, feeling the negative vibes, tried to undo the damage and attempted to get that respectability that he craved so badly. So, with his meal tickets on Yat-sen now gone, Morris had to get on someone's payroll fast, or else he'd be stuck either slumming it, or perhaps even be forced to return to Canada. But thanks to the historic and game-changing turn of events, and Cohen's well-known association with Sun Yat-sen and his inner circle, not to mention being in the right place at the right time, Morris Cohn's profile as the consummate insider to China politics was going to be greatly enhanced. You had, as a response to the May 30th movement, a general strike in not only Guangzhou, but in Hong Kong as well. This lasted for 16 months, from June 1925 to October 1926. You remember the May 30th incident? May 30th, 1925 in Shanghai? Troops under the British opened fire into a crowd of Chinese protesters and killed nine and wounded many others. Among other things, this resulted in a 16-month-long strike and a massive wedge was pounded in between the local Chinese and the foreign imperialists. This Shenggang, Dapagong, or Canton, Hong Kong strike of 1925-26 shook the economic foundations of Hong Kong. The British government needed to bail the colony out with loans. This May 30th movement was an early attempt by the four-year-old Chinese Communist Party to flex their muscles and test out their efforts at organizing on a mass scale. The strike had quite an impact on Canton. It was big news, and the foreign business interests were getting clobbered. Morris Cohen, through his access to TV Song and Chen Yo-ren, a.k.a. Eugene Chun, was able to keep the illusion alive of his importance inside the KMT government in Canton. Eugene Chun, by the way, was a colorful character from 1920s Chinese history. He was essentially Sun Yat-sen's foreign minister and carried out diplomacy on behalf of the rival government in the South. More about him, perhaps, some other time? You know, even though only a gopher inside the organization, Morris Cohn was still, nonetheless, in the inner circle. And he knew all these historic names inside the KMT. He wasn't making this up. He came and went and carried messages and acted in the usual intermediary role. When the strike petered out in October 1926, Morris wrote later, quote, I feel that my efforts in obtaining the unconditional calling off of the strike and boycott had done a little good. I might state that I was present at the conference where I had been detailed by the Chinese government to give them protection. End quote. 1926 and into 1927, Cohn did much to consolidate his role as the Western intermediary of choice to the Southern leadership in general and TV Song in particular. TV Song had made Morris head of security at the new Central Bank of China in Shanghai. He was 
little more than an errand boy and sort of a Brinks guard, but he did take his job seriously. These were the kind of things he did within the Song inner circles. And because he was so close to all the action all the time, people who didn't know any better misconstrued his exact role and importance inside the organization. So word on the street was that Morris Cohn was quietly working with all the contending parties and acting in the role of go-between. Things were leading up to a crescendo, which happened, as we all know from past episodes, on April 12th, 1927. Chiang Kai-shek let loose the Shanghai Massacre and the subsequent White Terror. Song Ching Ling fled to Moscow. The KMT began to fracture, and the power centers in Nanjing, led by Chiang Kai-shek and those in Guangzhou, who Morris Cohn was friendly with, had moved their rival government from Canton to Wuhan. Both sides began to start sharpening their knives. This wasn't going to be good for Morris. And now, with Madame Sun out of the country and the songs lying low, he had to go out and find a new and steadier source of income. The Suns and Songs might have liked him, but Jiang Kai-shek wasn't particularly fond of Morris Cohn. They never cozied up. Same went with Song Mei Ling, Madame Jiang. In early 1928, Sun Ke, Hu Han Min, and Si Si Wu went on a world tour to drum up support for China. Who were these guys? Well, these are all characters from the 1920s and 30s. Sun Ke, he was Sun Yat-sen's son. Because of his father, Sun Ke was a major player in the Canton government. So was Hu Han Min. He was a very complicated guy and one of the most powerful KMT leaders in the post-Sun era. Si Si Wu was the son of Wu Tingfang, a Qing dynasty diplomat and later a diplomat in the early Republican period. He was a very interesting person, and Wu Tingfang, in his capacity as minister to the United States at the turn of the century, did a lot to speak out against anti-immigration laws directed specifically against the Chinese. So Si Si Wu, he was a chip off the old block and also ended up as a diplomat. In the beginning of 1928, these three, with Morris Cohn in tow, started a whirlwind global tour to spread awareness about China and to get diplomatic support. And this ended up being the trip that was going to give Morris some of the importance he was pining for. Once they arrived in the UK, Morris Cohn got to visit his family briefly, first time in a very long time. They had moved up to Manchester now, and when this distinguished group from China traveled to Africa, Morris broke away. This was in March of uh, 1928, and he headed towards Zimbabwe, then called Rhodesia, to visit his sister who lived there. In one of his patented typical acts of extravagance and generosity, Morris packed his sister and family up and sent everyone first class back to England where there was a happy reunion in the Cohn family. Morris lived lavishly and showered all his relatives with gifts and regaled them with his stories from China. After a few months' absence, hanging out with the extended Cohen family, he hooked up with the group of Chinese diplomats in June 1928. And they were all down in the dumps due to the tour, not working out at all. They weren't getting any face wherever they went, and rather than gaining support for the nationalist government, all they got was the cold shoulder. Their last chance was going to be in England. All the disappointment up till now would be forgotten if they could only gain government support in London. Morris Cohn, in so many words, said, hey, leave it to me. And he rushed back to London and started using his two-gun Cohn ways to line up a whole string of heavyweights to meet with the delegation. Thanks to Morris, they got to rub elbows with several MPs, plus Ramsey MacDonald, David Lloyd George, and Austin Chamberlain. Austin is not the peace in our time Chamberlain. That was his half-brother Neville. Wherever this group went, they were given maximum face, and Morris, he just went along for the ride. With these nationalist leaders enjoying the recognition from the British government leaders, Morris also got to bask in their glory. By now... Morris had made sure he was referred to as General Cohen. As far as anyone knew, he wasn't a general, or even an honorary general. But Morris Cohn didn't allow that one inconvenient truth to stop him. He was getting a lot of shine, and totally loving it. With the momentum gained from the visit to Britain, the group moved on to America next. 
Morris Cohn, again, did all the necessary advance work and made all the calls needed to marshal forces. So the UK and US visits went excellently. By the end of August, Morris was back in Hong Kong, and at last, he had what he believed was the respectability he was long overdue. Up till now, Morris Cohn had struggled with his own kind to get the respect and recognition he craved so badly. This U.S. and U.K. trip turned out to be a nice diplomatic coup for the nationalists, and Morris Cohn genuinely had a hand in its success. Let me read a long quote from the British Consul General about his take on Morris's 1928 trip. He said, quote, Although he is an uneducated and simple-minded person, he takes himself very seriously as a politician and close touch with the inner intrigues and activities of his Guomindang friends. For the past two years, he has regularly called on me and discussed at length on the political situation. His theme always was the revolutionary movement in China need not necessarily be anti-British, and that the British authorities could easily capture it and oust the Russians by sympathizing with the South and giving them practical help. In other words, by allowing them to procure the arms necessary for their struggle, which they could at present only get from the Russians. I suspect that this was not disinterested advice, as he wished to act as the Chinese agent for the purchase of arms in Canada, which would have been a lucrative business. Although Cohn undoubtedly held quite an unusual place, for a foreigner, in the confidence of the Chinese authorities in the city, I imagine they told him chiefly the things they wanted him to pass on to me, and I, of course, used him for the same purpose. Nevertheless, he has frequently given me valuable information, and has, on occasion, been of assistance in arranging matters where the Commissioner for Foreign Affairs could do nothing. Cohen is an adventurer with a shady past, and in his endeavor to obliterate his early reputation, he is inclined to exaggerate the importance of his present position and his influence with the Canton officials. But in spite of his Canadian record, I have not found him untruthful or untrustworthy. In fact, it is only fair to say that since I have known him, he has used such influence as he may possess with the Chinese authorities in the direction of restoring friendly relations with the British and helping British trade. This is in accordance with his own financial interests, as he earns commissions on purchases of British materials for government purposes and had ambitious projects regarding railway construction to be undertaken by Canadian contractors. End quote. Well, this is as good a place as any to put in the bookmark and close the curtains for now. More Moisha Tugun Cone next time as we follow his life in the post-Sun Yat-sen, Nanjing decade part of Chinese history, as well as his story during and after World War II. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Los Angeles, California, thanking all of you for listening, who made it this far. See you next time, I hope, for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.